a broad view of climate change. The thing about the Smithsonian, the wonderful thing about the Smithsonian, is that we have resources in so many different disciplines in the science, art, history, and culture. And so to be able to take a topic like climate change and look at it from across all of those different perspectives. If you were busy this week, probably teaching your own class or doing your own job, you may not have had a chance to, t to tune, in tune in in, in real, real time. time. But you can always go but back to the archive sessions and take I see that Stanley has joined us again, so I'm going to turn it back over now to Jonathan, and I'll talk to you again at the end of the conference. Thank you, Stephanie. It's nice to hear your voice. And uh, Stephanie and her team have been doing such amazing work organizing the conference and bringing it together, and we'll look forward to hearing from her at the end of the day as well. Stanley, it's great to see you. We got worried that the fog had uh, found its way into your office there at the Marine Laboratory, but we'll find out. It's nice to see you smiling. We are going to go ahead and uh, kick things off now. Uh, for those of you joining us for the first time during the conference, we do encourage your questions. And uh, please allow me to remind you how to submit questions for Stanley and others as we go along. Um, on the left side of the screen, you will find a box that says chat Q&A. Just type in at any point, and we will do our best to share your uh, comments with Stanley and his team there in Panama. So uh, we look forward to hearing from you. This session is live because we do want it to be a conversation. So please join us in that dialogue. We have, we're very lucky to have a very important part of the Smithsonian represented during this online conference. And it's a part that most people who visit the National Mall would, might never know existed if it were not uh, for the good outreach efforts of people like Stanley Heka Damoreno, who's going to tell us what's going on in the Caribbean the, about the Smithsonian's efforts there in terms of research and education. And he's going to entertain your questions and even have perhaps some special guests with him there today. So please join me in welcoming Stanley in Caleta. Stanley, over to you. Very happy to be able to link with you and uh, good morning to you all who participants. Um, Jonathan, do we have Latin American countries in the pro in the program? We do, and I'll ask if any are represented in our live session today to go ahead and let us know. I know we've had a number of people joining us uh, from Latin America throughout the conference. Countries as well joining us in this conversation. So once again, uh, buenos dias, bonjour, uh, good morning from beautiful Galeta Point Marine Lab. This is a Smithsonian facility of the Smithsonian Tropical Research. Uh, we are located in the narrowest, lowest portion of the New World on the Caribbean entrance to the Panama Canal and right next to the city of Colon, which is a daughter of the Panama Railroad built in the 1850s during the California Gold Rush. A lot of history, both natural history and history of the world has taken place and Galeta has been a witness to it. And we would like to share with you a little bit about Panama first, which is our host country. Panama is a small country, 75,000 kilometers square, 50,000 miles, about the size of a U.S. state like South Carolina. It has slightly over 3 million people. Um, it is uh, very narrow. It's very long, and the bulk of its population lives on the coast or very near the coast. Cologne, which is the city next to which where we are, it's almost at sea level. So most of the Panamanian population can be considered coastal people, and whatever happens to the oceans will have an immediate impact on the people of the Isthmus of Panama. Panama means, in the language of the Cueva people who were here at the time when the Europeans came to the New World, it means an abundance of fishes. So we will share with you, with these, uh, this PowerPoint presentation, a little bit of what we do uh, in terms of research, in terms of education, conservation, and research. And we'd also talk to you what are the main challenges facing countries like Panama, Central America, and the 
in terms of how do we manage development, which is necessary, with conservation of fragile resources like the mangroves, like the coral reefs, like the seagrass bed. So let us start then with our, what we'd like to show you, our first slide. And in this map, it shows the Panama looks like a mess, laying in between the Pacific Ocean and the Caribbean. In red there, you will see the facilities of the Smithsonian. Our oldest dates back to 1923, which is Barro Colorado Island, which is in Gatun Lake. Uh, it's probably one of the oldest, if not the oldest, tropical research station in our part of the world. Galeta is number six, and it's an old U.S. Navy facility, part of a very large Navy station called Cocosolo. Maybe you have some people in the audience who at one time or another came to Panama and remember the U.S. presence here and heard about the greatest U.S. naval station outside of the U.S., Cocosolo Naval, and then Caleta was part of that. And Smithsonian had been in this station now since the 1960s. And we are next to the city of Colón, and you see it there in your screen now. Colón is named after the great discoverer of the New World, Cristobal Colón, Christopher Columbus. It is a daughter of the Panama Railroad and the California Gold Rush. When a little tiny island of corals and mangroves was uh, built to make way for a little city, a city built by the Panama Railroad, based out of New York. And then when the French came here with the Lesseps in the 1880s, they landfilled the other part of the second half of the island, and that became Christopher. So the full name of the, our neighbor, the city where we're at, is Cristobal Colón, Christopher Columbus. It's interesting that this city, well, it's one of the few named after the discoverer of the New World. Colón is a city that is growing very fast on account of the expansion of world trade and one of the, the most dynamic economic activities is port development. And also there's this massive expansion of the free zone. In seen now, that is Galeta Point Marine Lab and where we do research you can see our coral reef in the background with the lagoons and the seagrass beds. And in the back of us, we will have the mangroves, this beautiful mangrove belt. In Galeta, our scientific research since the 60s has concentrated on the coral reefs, on the seagrass beds, and of course, the mangroves. One of the most important pieces of work which is going on here is the work done by uh, Dr. Wayne Zuza uh, from Berkeley as regards to the mangroves. In, you will see there the mangroves are one of the, they're absolutely stunning ecosystems and under enormous threat throughout all Central America. In the case of Panama, uh, we have lost about 40% of our mangroves in the last 30 years because of uh, economic development, particularly port development, the shrimp industry, and this is having an enormous effect on the coastline. Besides the... Uh, Stanley, if, if I may interrupt for, for one moment, uh, we did have a question to go back just one step. If you could say a little bit more about uh, mangroves, what they are, what differentiates them from, from uh, 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 other uh, species. Over to you. ...systems of the tropics, the series of species of trees that are able to survive in salt water and a combination of salt water with fresh water, with brackish water, or as we say in, in Spanish, agua salobre, which is más o menos salty, más o menos fresh. Uh, Panama has 20 different species of mangroves. At, at Galeta, we have four major species, the dominant one being 
called red mangroves. The mangrove stands of Panama uh, are an excellent, when you look at the mangroves at Galeta, they're stunning because we are outside of the hurricane belt. We are maybe 100, 200 a kilometer south of the hurricane belt, so Panama hasn't been hit by these monstrous hurricanes that strike the Caribbean coast of Central America or the US or the islands of the Caribbean. So when you come to Galeta, and I hope you do in the future, Jonathan, uh, or those who are listening to us, you must come and see, appreciate the stunning size of the mangroves, their height, their width, the stand, and it is uh, one of the impressive uh, uh, sights of nature. And of course, like all great things of nature, it is for free. Part of our research uh, on, in Galit, one of the most important pieces of research, uh, Smithsonian Tropical Research uh, here, it's monitoring the Caribbean. And we have put for you there a uh, little slide showing some of the instruments we have. We have 26 of them monitoring the Caribbean as if it were a patient. You know, the temperature, salinity, is it rising, uh, wind, wind direction. And uh, there's, we put the address of the Galeta uh, scientific monitoring program, which dates from the 1970s, early 1973. And it's part of the effort done by Spry and Smithsonian to monitor our planet. And this is the way it would look uh, on a daily, daily basis, the direction of the wind, the tides. But it's part of a long-term effort to find out where is the rhythm of nature going? What is she telling us? Is something happening to her? That's what Galeta's instrument. Uh, some of the instruments uh, are it functioning today, uh, like our rain gauge. It's still the same rain gauge that was installed back in 73, so I must congratulate the people who built it, just as, as good as the Panama Canal, which the locks are still working after 100 years. So let me show you now, uh, unless somebody has a question on our instruments. Let me say, go now, from our side. And we, we, yes. we do have a couple of quick questions, if, if you don't mind the interruption. Um, we had a couple more mangrove questions. One of them is an interesting one that comes from Juan here at the, uh, at the National Zoo. Do you have a sense as to what it is about the mangrove ecosystem that is making it usable for the shrimp industry? All throughout, the, uh, above all, as the shrimp industry has tended to collapse in the Pacific side of Central America and South America. Developers found out that the mangroves habitats are one of the best to breed shrimp. So on the Pacific side of Central and South America, in the 70s and the 80s, there was like a frontier spirit. There were a lot of concessions given by the governments to cut down the mangroves and to do this enormous shrimp farming and that put what perhaps shrimp farming and mostly for export to the US and to Europe that was the leading cause of destruction of the mangroves in our part of the world parallel to that was the uh, the development of a particular grass it's called sacate alemán it was developed in Mexico and it was tolerant, this grass, to salinity. And cattlemen were able to cut down the mangroves at increasing speeds from Mexico to Panama and further south, and cut down the mangroves and plant this grass. And therefore, you will see that throughout Central America, there's been a, a, an enormous expansion of the pasture lands into areas formerly covered by these stunning, beautiful mangroves. It's one of the challenges that still remains. But mangroves are still, there's a lot of pressure on them because the humble people who have full land, the mangroves have become like the common forest of the 19th century. Uh, the humble people need uh, charcoal, they need firewood, 
They need round wood to build their houses. So as there is less land available to peasants or campesinos, as we call them, uh, they go into the mangroves to get construction material to uh, prepare their food. So mangroves are under an enormous amount of stress in our part of the world. I don't know if that responds to your uh, the question we had from one of our participants, uh, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, Stanley. I believe it does. Um, and we'll, we have a couple more questions, uh, including one from Guatemala, but we will come back to those in just uh, a moment. Uh, and we also have, Stanley has a short presentation and then a special guest and plenty of time for additional questions. So we'll weave a few more questions in as we go, but do know we have plenty of time at the end. So back to you, Stanley. Uh, let's, uh, look at, let's say that uh, mangroves have a fundamental uh, importance to protect the coastline, and we will get to that later. And this is one of the destruction of the mangroves in our region has uh, enormous implications for the countries in the tropics, which are coastal. Uh, one, uh, although Smithsonian Tropical Research has been doing scientific work on these ecosystems uh, since the 60s, uh, we began our marine environmental education program in the year 2000 to link the research we do at Galeta with the Panamanian classrooms. And the reason is, if you look at the textbooks of natural sciences in Panama and in Central America, there is not much about mangroves, very little on corals, and hardly anything on seagrass beds. And also, most of the research information on these ecosystems is in English. But 98%, 99% of the teachers in our part of the world do not read English. So it, was the it is the function of our educational program to link the work we do in sciences at Caleta, or at STRI in general, to the Panamanian classroom. And let me show you uh, how we have built gradually our facilities. Here we see Jorge Morales, one of our nature guides, with a little turtle, which was brought for, which for, by some children from the, uh, one of the villages next to Colón. Uh, and the little kids have found a turtle wrapped up in a fishing uh, line. And the kids uh, were wondering what to do. And then one of them remembered that he had come to a beautiful place called Galeta, that they should bring that little turtle to our laboratory where she could be taken care of. Her name is Tibo. We started with 200 uh, little children from an orphanage in Cologne in 2000, and now we receive about 10,000 children from all over Panama, and they are led by our 19 guides. Our scientific program is absolutely indispensable to train our guides. And one of our first great classrooms was our mangrove boardwalk. It's about 300 meters, I think. Goes through our beautiful mangrove around Galita. When the tide goes up, it's like a, oh, it's like a undersea world. It's just, just so fascinating. It allows us to take children so they can learn how to identify the, the species of mangroves we have here. And about 40,000 kids have gone through that mangrove boardwalk. It was a major challenge to build it, and children enjoy it magnificently. We also uh, got hold of a second-hand pontoon, brought it here, anchor it, and there you see our floating classroom. Uh, kids love it, small and big. Also, when twice a year, when the great phenomena of the migration of the birds of the Americas take, takes place when the birds coming from Alaska are heading to Patagonia and vice versa. Well, that's a big aircraft carrier. Lots of little birds. Uh, if you saw, if you want to come down to look at the migration of the birds of the Americas, as you know, five of the seven migratory routes of the birds of the Americas flow through the Isthmus of Panama. 
I'd like to show you now a part of what we also do. We do short field courses uh, with STRI scientists working together with teachers. This is the group from East Carolina University, but we also have courses with McGill University in Canada and also with other universities like Princeton. We have also found that not only we have to make sciences, natural sciences, fascinating, stimulating to children. And in this struggle to promote the sciences, an understanding of the value of the coastal habitats, the teachers are absolutely fundamental. So we have been gradually getting involved, together with the Ministry of Education of the Republic of Panama, in training teachers at our lab and also going to schools. Here you see a uh, Smithsonian scientist of the Panama Paleoecology Project of Dr. Carlos Jaramillo, who are now at this moment looking at the enlarge the canal and looking at the geology that has been revealed there, training the teachers. We provide two weeks of very intensive training. In this case, the STRI scientist is showing the teachers how to read the rocks. In this case, the Gatun formation, of which Dr. Tony Coates, who's here with us, is a great specialist. He will tell you about the 20 million year history of these uh, geological formation that tells the story of the birth of the Caribbean and the rise of the isthmus and the linking of the two great continents of the Americas. For, for us at STRI, it's absolutely fundamental to train the future scientists of these countries. Therefore, with support of the private sector, uh, with companies in Panama, with friends of sciences abroad, we've been able to establish a series of uh, scholarships and internships. And here you see one of our interns, Jorge Moises Herrera, in the mangrove forest at Galeta, studying migratory birds to see if they do have in their blood uh, diseases that can be transmitted from uh, birds to humans. And in, uh, the training of future scientists is one of the most important activities that a research center like STRI can do. One of our, we're beaming to you, our come today from this little facility within our lab. It's our research library. It looks small, it is small, but it's very valuable, very important. It's the only research library in Colón. And teachers use it, our guides use it, our researchers use it. We encourage the members of the Panama Ecological Police to use it. We stimulate, and what, what, the reason why it's so valuable uh, it's because it's the only research library in the city of Colón. And it has our bibliography here, and we have put our email address in there if you're interested in accessing the bibliography that we have. We ask, let me say that as fishing stocks have been depleted east and west of the Panama Canal, we found ourselves facing fishermen coming to fish inside the protected area. So we had to go from a situation of confrontation and evasion into one of collaboration. So public outreach became for us, and it is as well for any research station in the developing countries of utmost importance. You have to reach the broader community and the people who make it. So one of our first target were the fishermen. We have a monthly series of talks called the Smithsonian uh, Talk of the Month. And there you see a photo of our poster that we put out electronically. Uh, we have our guides going to the uh, radio stations in Cologne. And the radio community has been very uh, supportive of us. And then at the bottom you will see uh, the audience, the general audience, the people of the city of Cologne at one of the local hotels who provide us for free the, the auditorium, listening to one of the Smithsonian researchers talk about the state of the corals of the Isthmus of Panama. Uh, Stanley, Stanley, if I, if I may interrupt. interrupt. Of course. 
we we had a, a couple of questions. Uh, one of them, um, you talked a little bit uh, earlier about the floating classroom. There was a quick question from Melissa Ramos about um, how are students picked to participate in that? We invite uh, the schools and they call us at 212-8191, 212-8192 and 93. That's Galeta Point. Of course, you have to dial 507, which is Panama. And uh, well, we just get sometimes, this is Panamanian school year, and this is our high season for students. Uh, they come from Colon, but they also come from the Pacific side of the Isthmus, as far as near the border with Costa Rica. Uh, we get kids from the fishing villages, we get kids from public high schools, uh, elementary schools, uh, from uh, private schools. We, we're getting an uh, increasing number of college students who want to come here and learn how to do, uh, uh, learn methods of studying the coastal ecosystem. So uh, Galeta is a very friendly, open operation. Anybody can come. Uh, we've just finishing uh, a very interesting project we started recently. We sent two of our kids, our uh, guides, to Costa Rica to one of their turtle uh, facilities in the Caribbean. When they came back, uh, together with some students of the University of Panama, they started monitoring turtles here. We're hoping that project uh, will carry on uh, with great enthusiasm with the young people of uh, Colum. After all, these are, these are their habitats. So, uh, Galeta is open to all. Oh, we're very happy to say we get more also companies bringing their workers here with their families to spend a uh, beautiful time uh, at Galeta. Let me, uh, I don't know, Jonathan, have we, uh, if we cover that part of your uh, listener's question? Yep, that, that's, that's great. That's Thank, great. You, Thank you, Stanley. Okay. In, in scene, you will see uh, for a, a small facility like Galeta at the great crossroads of the world, at a city which is growing very fast and where ports are increasing and uh, commerce and everything is putting, uh, putting pressure on development, uh, on, on, on resources. It is absolutely indispensable for us not only to reach classrooms and train teachers, but we also have to work very closely with stakeholders. And in, in the image here you see our fishermen from a very poor barrio from the city of Colón, it's called La Paita. And we, we have been uh, working with the fishermen east and west of the canal. We also work with companies, uh, we, with the local government in Panama. One of the fascinating uh, uh, changes which is happening is we're, it's, it's a process called municipalization. This is the devolution of power from the central government to local government. So in Cologne, in the future, the local government, the mayor's office, will have a lot of say about the future of natural resources. So we are involved uh, very closely in working with the local government of the city of Cologne uh, so that in the sustainable development plan for this city, mangroves and coral reefs and seagrass beds will be part of the sustainable development effort. And I think any research station has to look at these other uh, members of the community, uh, the private sector, in our case our ports, the free zone of Panama, the airport, uh, the power companies, so we, we live, we, research is not done in an abstract way. It is, move, it, it is done in a very complex, changing socio-political and economic uh, environment. Let me show you now, uh, we're very proud of this, uh, with the support of the uh, Smithsonian Women's Committee, we install an underwater camera. That's our Galeta wet cam. And in blue there at the bottom, you will see our webcam. When the water is clear, you can see uh, what the inhabitants of the Caribbean look like under our pier. So we hope if today, after this program, you uh, link to our underwater web, you can see the 
Well, the red snappers and the black snappers and a host of sardines that make the chain of life here at Galita. Now let me, uh, let me uh, come to the, uh, the straightaway of my conversation with our viewers, uh, Jonathan. And it's, uh, this is what's happening around us. Uh, countries want to develop. They want to generate jobs and wealth. But that has a cost. And to us, it's that as the as commerce expands, as shipping increases, as more and more containers uh, move from one continent to another, in the case of Panama, it's where we are on the Caribbean side. More and more mangroves are cut down. Uh, then they're landfill up to uh, three, four meters, twelve feet, with cement to put uh, patios big yards for containers. So in the last 10 years, with the growth of world commerce, there's been a massive destruction of mangroves in Colón. And that has a downstream effect on the, on the coral reefs, uh, silting. We, we also face here at we also face here at, at Galeta and on the Caribbean side of uh, Panama, that because of the expansion of slash and burn agriculture and cattle ranching inland, as tropical forests are being cut down for the expansion of cattle ranching, the amount of erosion that is taking place has jumped, and this is silting uh, downstream and in one of the, our monitoring programs that we do on the Caribbean side, we found out that there's more and more silt coming out of the creeks and the rivers from the highlands because of the process of deforestation. About 20% uh, of the increase in carbon dioxide, it's due to uh, deforestation. Now, as the mangroves of Colón have been cut intensely in the last 10 years and landfilled, it has had a devastating effect on the surrounding countryside. Last year, for example, uh, as a direct result of the cutting down of the mangroves and landfilling to do container yards, there's been five major floods in the city of Colón, and this is what you see and see, it's just uh, the the big, this is the Cologne Free Zone uh, depots, and this is the road leading to Galeta. Uh, what it looks like in one of those and the pouring thunderstorms. Uh, and we must, uh, almost coming to the end of our conversation, this part of our conversation is that storms in the, our part of the Caribbean, according to our instruments, are getting meaner. This is a photo of uh, Galeta last year, uh, at this time of the year. Uh, the waves were hitting the lab. We hadn't had any, something like that happen before. The waves are crashing against our, our lab and shaking the building. Uh, the sea seemed to be higher than uh, Tierra Firme, as we call it, the land. And th it is there that you realize that coral reefs and mangroves are the two great natural barriers provided by nature to us for free. So in a time of global climate change in which meaner and more frequent storms are being predicted, it is of utmost importance for the people of Panama, for the people of Central America and the Caribbean, all over the tropics, to protect our natural barriers. Galeta, it's a beautiful spot. It's a mystical, it's a poetical place. It is a place to come with contact with nature, to listen to it. Uh, so we do hope that the style of development that we choose is one in which there will be space for economic development, but also for mythical, magical spots like Galita, where we can come in contact with nature, that there should also be space 
in our development process for science, for education, and for wonderful recreation where children can come and be in contact with the spectacular nature of the tropics at the coastline. Thank you, Stanley. Thank you, Stanley. Uh, very much, um, and also for for neatly, uh, if not, um, uh, well, poetically, bringing us back to uh, this issue of climate change and the importance of the ecosystem that you've described for us and the work that you're doing there. Um, we do have a few questions, and I know I just wanted to check. I think you also have your a guest with you there as well. Is is Tony there with you? I believe so. So let me just take one or two questions. Uh, maybe we'll we'll consider this a lightning round of questions, and then uh, we'd like to hear uh, a little bit from Tony. So here's one or two quick ones for you, and this might be for for Tony as well. Um, we have a, a number of people joining us from the Bahamas, including Delino Moss. And Delino asks, uh, do you know of any research that's being done on the mangroves that grow in the Bahamas? Uh, you can go ahead and... And, and uh, you can you go, go ahead can and... and I know that there you we go, have, we can hear you now. Um, an expert, Ilka Fella, at... Um, CERC in the Smithsonian in Washington and she has been doing regional studies of mangroves and may well have been studying in the um, Bahamas. I can't answer the question directly but if your questioner wishes to follow up, uh, Ilka Fella at CERC, at the Smithsonian's Environmental Research Center would surely know the answer to that question. And uh, perhaps, perhaps I, I could, could ask, ask Stanley, Stanley to, to formally introduce, introduce us to, to Tony, Tony and, his, and his work. Well, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Tony Coates. He's a geologist, a paleogeologist. Tony has uh, fallen in love with the Isthmus of Panama. He's probably made the most important contribution to our understanding of the evolution of the Isthmus of Panama and our part of the world more than anybody else. Uh, he has worked both on the Caribbean side and the Pacific side of the Isthmus. He, I consider to be the man who taught us how to read the rocks. Tony, welcome to Galeta. <laughs> yeah, we, we've been looking at climate change in what, uh, what geologists call deep time, and that is to say uh, over a period of se several millions of years. And of course the rise of the Isthmus of Panama over the last, say, 10 or 12 million years literally changed the world. It changed uh, the circulation of the oceans, uh, which changed in turn the climate. It's the reason why London doesn't freeze in the winter and, and the St. Lawrence Seaway does. It perhaps triggered the evolution of the Ice Age in the Northern Hemisphere, and it maybe um, dramatically changed climate um, around the world, uh, particularly on the eastern side of the Atlantic. Uh, and in some cases, scientists would say triggered or affected the evolution of humans themselves. So in deep time, Panama has had a truly dramatic effect on climate um, and, and has in fact changed the world. We have been of course more interested here in uh, Stanley's eloquent description of what goes on at Galeta. Galeta is a perfect example of several of what the Smithsonian's great contribution to climate change is, and that is the ability to monitor over long periods of time changes that take a while to detect and to separate the signal from the noise, as, as the scientists say, you need a, a long series of databases. Galeta has been going for many, many years, so has measurements on Bado Colorado, and of course the Panama Canal has, has added a, a huge set of databases. And what we've discovered from that is that um, Smithsonian Stry's contribution to climate change involves, for example, um, what's going to happen as CO2 inevitably rises in the atmosphere. We know it's been dramatically increasing since the Industrial Revolution, and of course, by trapping heat, it engenders an increase in temperature. Well, as we have a tremendous uh, program of studying trees as they grow, by put, growing them in elevated CO2. Dr. Klaus Winter is one of the great experts in the world on that so that we will know what the effect on trees will be when the um, CO2 levels go very, very much higher as they are predicted to do. 
We know that trees will grow faster, they will produce more leaves, um, there will be a, a significant change in the tropical uh, forest ecosystems. Um, the, the increase in heat also it, uh, may affect the forest because in the tropics, temperature varies very slightly and therefore trees in particular are probably highly adapted to the particular temperature that exists today. If we, as is predicted, see a rise in temperature of two to three or four degrees over the next century or two, then many of these species of forest trees will no longer be in their optimum and may even not be in their survivable range of temperature and we will see some dramatic changes in species composition. So these studies are being undertaken by um, the Center for Tropical Forest Science of STRI, which is, has 34 sites all around the world studying carefully, getting us actuarial statistics on the growth, the death, and the recruitment of, of species of trees in forests, and tracking how they change with dramatic climate change events, such as El Nino, such as increased storms, as Stanley has mentioned, and so forth. So STRI, in addition to Galata, which is one of its gems, of course, has several other projects that are tracking the various aspects of of change which are going to be generated by the, uh, the increase in CO2 and the increase in temperature that we will see in the near future. Back to you, Jonathan. Thank you. And I think in the process of uh, providing us that background, you answered a great question from Stephanie about, um, based on your research, what changes do you anticipate in Galeta as a result of climate change? Um, if you uh, I'll, I, I think you gave us a, a nice uh, overview of that. Um, we had a question that came in a little bit earlier, a comment and a question from, uh, from Arkansas. Uh, Wendy says, I've been reading how mangroves can provide a barrier to slow the effects of tsunamis, for instance, as Stanley mentioned. I'd be interested in learning if geoscientists find tsunami-related deposits with fossil mangroves. Um, that's a good question. The, the problem there is that um, some things are wonderfully fossilizable in the, in the geological record and others are not. And unfortunately, mangrove systems, since they lie right, as Stanley has, has mentioned, right, right at the interface between the land and the sea, they're very subject to erosion. And um, it's not a good place to become, to become fossilized in the long-term future. So there are, there are not that many examples. It's not a frequent occurrence to see uh, mangrove Fossil, fossil mangrove beds. I have seen them in, in many places. Um, when you add on to that the fact that tsunamis are not a very common occurrence in, term, in terms of it's not a daily or weekly or annual uh, uh, occurrence, that there, are, there must be very few examples. Um, but I think there are a couple of, of, of deposits that could only be tsunami simply because you can't, you can't transport uh, pieces of rock the size of a house in very many ways other than volcanic explosions or tsunamis and uh, for that reason um, they're, they're, they're rather rare but they're rather spectacular when you do find them. So there are one or two examples but they're, very, they're not very common. Thanks Tony. We have a question Thanks, from Tony. the Davis Academy. We have a question from the Davis Academy where uh, uh, at least a dozen students are joining Mrs. London there. And the question was, how long does it take for a mature mangrove forest to develop uh, or form? The studies of Dr. Wayne Zuza from the University of California at Berkeley here at Galeta shows that mangroves can, in the case of Panama, where they're not hit by hurricanes uh, and devastated like most of Central America and the Caribbean, it really takes very little, a short span of time for them to grow into stunning uh, uh, vegetable uh, uh, structures. Uh, in, in, in the case of Galeta, they're 20, 25, 30 meters in height. Uh, in, if you can cut down a mangrove in Panama, maybe in 50 years, uh, they're just uh, stunning as they were. Uh, once you leave them, if, uh, if you don't do away with them, which is in our case uh, by development, uh, I, I have seen here in Galeta in only 10 years uh, spots where everything had been cut down and nature with her 
sabiduría, se dice en Spanish, with her natural wisdom. Uh, she takes over and in, you, just, you can actually see it happening around the lab. Little tiny seedlings that suddenly sprout and become larger. It's beautiful to see how the power of nature uh, in the isthmus to grow back and heal herself. Stanley's um, example it, it can be demonstrated right here in Galeta because no. several years ago we had a major oil spill in the in uh, in Galeta, and of course everybody rushed with money to mend the damage, and uh, it was discovered that where we took out the damaged mangroves and planted new plants, um, they usually died and didn't prosper. But where we just left the mangrove to itself, it grew back the most powerfully and the most rapidly of all, so that uh, it, mangroves do have a, a great power to recuperate. They won't recuperate, of course, if you just completely bulldoze them away. But um, as Stanley has pointed out, if you ever go to mangroves in the Bay of Florida, you never see a big a branch of a mangrove bigger than about 10 centimeters in diameter, whereas you can go to many parts of Panama, and certainly around Galeta, and you see a tree that can be up to three or four feet in diameter. And, and, and high like a major uh, forest canop uh, uh, canopy tree. So they, they, you never see that in places where hurricanes are continually um, pounding the, um, the mangrove systems. We, uh, we're running a little bit short on time, which is sad because all of us, uh, are, no matter where we are, I think, are enjoying listening to you and taking a, uh, uh, a visit remotely or virtually to where you are. But I want to sneak in one or two quick questions. We'll just have you maybe give a very very short answers to what might be very lengthy questions. But one of them is from Pino, and it's really interesting. One of the sessions yesterday addressed indigenous populations and climate change. Is the indigenous population in Panama uh, being affected by the reduction of mangroves? Of course, because uh, you know, uh, ten percent of the population of Panama are indigenous communities. You have seven in Panama. Uh, they, about 25% of the territory of Panama, it's what's called Comarcas Indígenas, Indigenous Territories, and of course several of our indigenous communities live on the coast. Uh, so what the faith of our coastal communities, indigenous, whether it be fishermen, is very much linked to what happens to what we do to these coastal habitats. In the case of uh, San Blas or Cunayala, the Cuna people who were here uh, centuries ago, uh, the impact on, on, on nature because of population growth, which is a phenomenon which is happening in all of the indigenous communities in Panama, there is a demographical revolution and the, popul the Indian indigenous population of Panama is growing at 3.3% per annum. So the pressure on fishing stock and on the corals and the mangroves is very intense. So I think that uh, the future of the coastal habitats uh, in Panama, it, it, it is uh, an issue that has, in which decisions have to be taken not only by the central government, by the local government, but the communities, including the indigenous communities of the Republic of Panama. Thank you, Stanley. We are, you can unclick your mic for one second. There we go. Perfect. We are pretty much out of time, but I want to point a couple of things out to you and to our online participants right now. First of all, um, there is a wonderful documentary that takes you on a tour uh, of uh, Galeta that Stanley and his team produced and posted in the virtual exhibit hall and we encourage you to check that out. It runs about 20 minutes so I don't suggest doing it right now because we want you to join us for Nancy Knowlton who will be uh, uh, doing her session in just about six minutes. So, But do check that out later. Um, there were also some interesting questions that uh, we did not yet get to and I would encourage people to visit the discussion area associated with Stanley and Tony's session uh, where we can continue that dialogue. For example, a great question from David about whether the educational programs uh, are being successful in mitigating the impacts and the destructive development. That's a great question. Uh, and we also have some other questions about future 
uh, plans and restoration plans that came to us from Patty in Indianapolis. So I'll encourage you to visit the discussion board, post some of those questions there, and the team from Stry will uh, make a visit there in the coming days and uh, and offer some some additional comments. So please uh, join me in thanking Stanley and and also Stanley for inviting Tony Coates to join us and for their whole team there uh, that allowed them to rem successfully transmit uh, from from Galeta Point. So thank you, Stanley. Thank you, Tony. Jonathan, thank you all for part of this wonderful experiment and going around the world. You can also look at the Galeta documentary in YouTube. YouTube. Mm -hmm. YouTube. All right. Thank you. Take care. All right. Thank and you. We encourage Take you guys care. to stay online. Yeah, we encourage us. you guys to stay online. And join us for Nancy Nolton's session in just a few moments, which will be right here in this room. Which will be right here in this room. Adios. <laughs>